God of wonderful mercy and just and love. And Lord, today we come and celebrate the goodness of our good, good Father. Hallelujah. And we lift up the name of Jesus this morning. Lord, you are wonderful. And Lord, we love you. Thank you today. Lord, today as we celebrate Father's Day, thank you, Lord God, for the greatest gift that you gave us by giving us your Son, Jesus Christ. The sacrifice of a father giving up his only begotten son. That whosoever would love him will not perish but have everlasting life. So Father, today, thank you that we come to celebrate dads today. But Lord, we come to give you the highest praise that you deserve. And Lord, thank you this morning for everything that you've done and are doing in our lives. Lord, today there are so many that are sick in body, Lord, with injury or, or uh, just sickness. And Lord, today, in the name of Jesus, we, we stand in the gap, believing God for a miracle in their lives today. Lord, we pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit to be with each one. You know each circumstance and each situation today. And Lord, we pray, God, for your favor in those situations. And we ask it in Christ's name. Let the church say amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Come with me this morning, if you will, to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Today we celebrate Father's Day. And uh, what greatest example that we have that maybe was in our lives that uh, for us that maybe grew up and had a godly father or had a father that was a great role model in our life. Um, I posted a picture yesterday of, on my Facebook page and, um, of uh, my dad and I uh, when we were in Florida. And uh, I'm thankful for the heritage of being raised in a great home uh, and with great value. And um, I pray today that if you're here, and whether your dad is, is uh, still here or whether he's not here, uh, that you were able to celebrate and are able to celebrate the goodness of who your dad is. Amen? Amen? So women, I have done you a favor today. I have done you the greatest service that I could possibly do as your pastor. I have broken down the men's thesaurus for you today on how men communicate with their wife. Amen? And everything I'm about to translate to you is correct. Amen? Because it comes from me as the pastor at this pulpit. Men don't always say what they mean, though, ladies. So allow me this morning to translate for your future benefit. And I'm going to list for you the top five reasons this morning of how or what men mean by what they say. Number one, when a man says it would take too long to explain, what he's really saying is I have no idea how it works. <laughs> it's okay to laugh in church, by the way, all right? It, you know, we want you to, you know, amen. Laughter's good medicine, it's biblical. The second thing, when man says take a break, honey, you're working too hard. What he's really saying is I can't hear the game over the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> the third thing is, is when a man says, can I help you with dinner? He means, why isn't it ready yet? <laughs> when a man says, you know how bad my memory is? He means I can remember the theme song to Hogan Heroes. The phone number of the first girl I ever dated was, Honey, I'm sorry I forgot your birthday. It's true. I, I, I told my wife recently, I, my short-term memory just seems like it's going. You know, I can't remember some things. When a man says, I heard you, he means I haven't the foggiest clue what you just said, and I'm hoping desperately that I can fake it well enough so that you'll not spend the next three days yelling at me. <laughs> when a man says, 
that I'm not lost, I know where I'm going. What he's really saying is, honey, I am totally lost and I'm too prideful to ask for directions. Isn't that the truth? Colossians chapter 3 this morning. As you're there with me today, the Bible says in verse 1 through 3, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Father, today I pray that this word that goes forth, Lord, allow the presence of your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and to challenge us and encourage us, God, to walk out stronger, to walk out with faith, God, to walk out, Lord, knowing the gifts that you've given us, that you would be glorified and honored. And we'll be sure to give you the praise and the thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I want to talk to you about those good spiritual mechanics and lay out for us in Scripture today something that's a little bit of a different twist with these verses. But there's a story about a son and his dad who was a pastor. One day the dad explained to his son how Saturday was a day to get things done around their house because of work, family, and church responsibility. The dad and his son had just finished mowing the lawn and were putting things away, and the dad thought this would be a terrific opportunity to spend the time with his son. The two of them had crawled up on the family's trampoline and gazed up in a blue sky with a puzzled look. The son turned and asked, Dad, why are we here? The dad thought this would be a great teaching opportunity, so he explained how we are children of our Heavenly Father and how he sent us here because he loves us and wants us to experience the things he created for us, how he wants to, us to serve one another, to learn, to grow, to develop those qualities that will allow us to return and live for him someday. The father paused and asked if he had answered the question for his son. And his son said, not really. And the dad then began to think, how else might he be able to answer that question when his son would again ask, Dad, why are we here? Weren't we supposed to pick up Mom an hour ago? <laughs> In the message today, I want us to see that when we look to God, that we find it possible to be focused on God's purposes in our life. I want to talk to you this morning about the importance of doing things God's way. When God created man, he created man in his image, in his likeness. Created him for fellowship, for a purpose. To be the head of the home. To be the leader in the church. God created man for this purpose that we would have fellowship with him. But the first thing I want to lay out for you this morning is that success will not come by our own ability. Number, uh, greatest example of that is when Moses failed when he tried to do things his way. Who delivered the children of Israel from Egypt? Was it Moses or was it God? God did it. God chose to bring Moses into a relationship with himself so that he, God, could deliver Israel. Did Moses ever try to take matters about the children of Israel into his own hands? Sure he did. Understanding what God is about is to do where I am, what's more important is telling God what I want to do for him. We see that as an example of Moses when he first got the idea to deliver Israel from the bondage to slavery from the Egyptians. Moses began to assert himself on behalf of his own people. So what might have happened if Moses had actually tried to deliver the children of Israel through human approach? I believe thousands and thousands would have been slain. 
It cost Moses 40 years of exile, Midian working as a shepherd and reorientating his life to God-centered living. The second thing that we can see of knowing having God's priority, good spiritual mechanics in our life, is to know success comes when we follow God's plan. Amen? God knows the plans that he has for us. Amen? Do you know the plan that God has for you in your life? A plan to prosper you, a plan to give you hope, a future? Amen? A plan to do what is according to his will. Moses succeeded when he allowed God to do it his way. Amen? How many of us that when we were raised as children, our parents would give us guidance and direction? How many of us always listen to our parents? How many of us sometimes never listen to our parents? How, how many of us never listened to our parents? How many of us thought we had the right plan? Come on, some of you. Some of you aren't telling me the truth here. Some of us thought that we could kind of lead by our own agenda, right? Some of us thought we had the plan for success, right? I remember as a kid when I was growing up, as we were talking about success and following the leadership of people that God would place in your life and having a good godly example, I remember as a kid I was more of a follower than I was a leader. I was shy, I was introverted, I, I was not an outspoken kid. I, I, you know, I had a lot of friends, but I didn't know how to lead. I, 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 sometimes my dad always said to me as a kid, he said, boy, if you ever get this thing right, one day you are going to be a great individual that can lead people as, as you would be a good leader. But he said, until then, until you stop following the wrong crowd, making bad decisions and stuff, and, you know, sometimes we had it all. How, how many of you ever had it figured out when you were 16, 17, 18, right? Huh? Right, yeah. I remember the first time, I, I, you know, when I, 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 I thought I was a man. I, I, was, I was a teenage boy. I was 16 years old, and, and uh, I was on the, and, and as a kid, uh, one of our policies in our home was that on a school night, you couldn't talk on the phone more than 10 minutes. And I was on the phone with, with, uh, with one of my friends for about 20 minutes. And my mother said to me, she said, David, she said, it's time to hang up the phone. And I said, Mom, I said, I will in a, in a little bit. And about five minutes went past, and she said, David, she said, you remember the rule that your dad made in the home. You need to listen and follow that rule. I said, Mom, I will in a minute. Just like that. My dad heard that. And my dad came in, and he softly laid his hands upon me, gently, and slid me over by the refrigerator and put me up against the refrigerator. And he said to me, he said, son, he said, when you think you're a real man and you want to raise your voice at your mother again, you'll find out what it is to be a man. I said, yes, sir. And I, I apologized to my mother and I never raised my voice ever again. I thought I had it figured out, right? It was going to be my way. My wife knows. But you know, Moses succeeded when he allowed God to do it his way. When we step out of the way and allow God to have his way and lead us, God's ways are indisputably better than our way. So why do we persist in doing things our own way rather than his way? Is it his way given and shown success? Amen? That's what we want to follow. So I see two specific areas, though, this morning as we talk about God's spiritual mechanics that I really want to kind of bring home here in this message. Number one, there becomes problems when we resist God. There becomes problems. You know, God's a perfect gentleman. He'll never force himself on any one of us, and we can't dictate the sovereignty of God. But there becomes a problem when we resist God. We see in Scripture the nation of Israel got in trouble 
time and time again because they would not listen to God in his way. And that is precisely the reason we get into trouble. We're stubborn and we refuse to submit to God. How many of you, before you came to Christ, when somebody would witness to you or share the gospel, you may be resisted at first? I know I did. I know I, I, I you know, I said, it was, the, it was the character phrase. God, I still have time in my life before I surrender to you. And I still, how many of you found out even when you served God, you still tried to do things your way and you found out that's really not sometimes the best option? All of you follow God's word in here. Amen. Praise the Lord. None of you have ever strayed, huh? I'm the only one. Uh, and transparency is perfect, amen? If your pastor can't be transparent, who can't? So what had God already done for Israel? He delivered them from the Egyptian bondage of slavery and brought them forth with mighty signs and wonders. And what did God promise to his people? He promised to bring them into a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey that represented prosperity. And how did the people respond? They continually responded with hearts of unbelief and stubbornness. They continually hardened their hearts through murmuring and complaining. Amen. Wives, look at your husbands this morning and just tell them in a gentle, soft voice. Don't murmur and complain. Just, just look at him and tell him that. Don't murmur and complain. Just wives, just do that to your husbands this morning. You know? <laughs> Amen. Sometimes there's no prosperity in murmuring and complaining. Amen. My wife says that to me from time and time again. And, you know, when, when we're talking about doing something and she makes a suggestion and she says to me, she says, why don't you just listen? And, you know, sometimes you find out that your wives are sometimes right more often than they're wrong. Amen? Wow, there's a lot of amens coming out from that one. But that's the truth. Sometimes there's that man pride that we have. There's, you know, I'm the head of the home. What I say goes. You know, last year, if you remember, and guys, don't do this, okay? Don't do this. But remember last year where I, I was talking about where Jesus looked at John and John, woman, do what he tells you. Don't do that, guys. Don't, don't do that this year, okay? Don't look at your wives and say woman, okay? Um, <laughs> that's not going to be a prosperous thing for you, Okay? I had a bunch of, I had a couple guys come and Pastor, you got me in a lot of trouble. I said, yeah, but it's scriptural. <laughs> it's a woman, right? But we got to follow God's way. We have to follow what he tells us. The second thing this morning is there's blessings when we adapt to God's ways. How many of you have found the blessing of God and the hand of God's favor? Amen. When you've been obedient, Amen. Psalm chapter 81 tells us, if my people would but listen to me, if Israel would follow my ways, how quickly would I subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes? Israel would have quickly subdued their enemies and entered the promised land if they would have heeded to God's way rather than stubbornly walking in their own ways. God has given us so many wonderful promises in his word. Amen? Huh? Are you with me this morning? He desires for us to walk in the abundance of life, receiving all things that pertain to life and godliness. But it is only as we choose to walk in his ways and not in our own plans and devices that we would inherit those blessings. We have to make a decision for good spiritual mechanics to be in our life. We've got to make a decision whether we would rather follow our own plan and wander around in spiritual wilderness or follow God's way and enter quickly to the promised land. 
But that choice we have to make is for ourselves. We can't live off the faith of others. And wives, as much as you want to get your husband to the promised land sometimes quicker than natural causes, be patient. Because we're still being shaped and molded and created in the image of our creator. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's why my wife tells me occasionally when we have holy headlock with one another, you know, intense spiritual fellowship, you know, I'll sometimes I'll say to my wife, I'll say, honey, you were right. I was wrong. She said, what? Let me hear that again. I want to record that <laughs> so that I can. But you know, guys, when we were created in the image of our creator, he gave us a great helpmate. Amen? He gave us a great helpmate. And sometimes our helpmates, when God gives us those helpmates in our life, they can help keep us on a course sometimes that will uh, benefit us. Amen? Amen? There's godly wisdom when women are serving the Lord and speak into your life as your mate, as your husband. And I'm encouraged by that. There are many times that God has used my wife, even as the role of the husband, but God has used my wife in incredible, incredible ways to speak. And I'll, I'll give you one of those examples. When we started Victory Lane Assembly of God in 2004, and we were meeting in the home of Tony and Mary Ann Stagg for about six months, planning what the church would look like before we even launched our first service. We drove down this road. And my wife looked at this church and she said to me, she said, wouldn't it be something one day if God opened the door for us to be in this church? That was in 2004. And I looked at her and I said, honey, I said, you don't ever wish a church to close their doors. I said, no, 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 I, I'm not saying that, but if something was to happen and and the church may be disbanded or whatever might have happened, wouldn't it be God's favor if he opened a door for us to have a facility like that? And you know what I did with that? You want to know the God's honest truth? I didn't process that. I didn't process that. And so now I draw closer and closer to my wife. But as the spiritual head of the home, as, as a leader of my home, it's my responsibility, good spiritual mechanics, to take that lead. You know, when I was, we were in the ministry of Teen Challenge, one of the things, we would go into the inner city churches, and, the, and these women, it was all the inner city churches, you notice, are filled with grandmothers, mothers, and kids. And when you would go into the inner city churches, and, and these women would see guys walking with ties and carrying their Bibles, man, they were rejoicing in the Lord because they were looking for good male role models. Good spiritual mechanics, men, is we lead our home. Amen? We lead our home. And you know what? I'm going to say this, and I say it with all loving kindness, and I say this as your pastor in, in a very loving way that I can. You know, sometimes we, we, get, to, we get into a, a spiritual funk and, and, and sometimes maybe our wives don't necessarily want to say, hey, you know, I just don't feel like going this morning. I don't feel like being part of, I don't feel like going to church. I just want to stay home and have a lazy day. Gentlemen, you need to take your wife and say, honey, we are going to church. We're going to church. You got to lead by example. I'm sorry. That's biblical. That's not coming from Pastor Dave's heart or thought, even though I'm communicating it to you that way. But that's a biblical standard. Amen? Amen. We need more men to lead. Correct. We need more men to stand up. We need more men to be the spiritual leader of their home and in the church. Amen? Amen. So in closing this morning...
We need understanding what God is all about to do what's most important is telling God, Lord, what do you want me to do for you? You know, so, here's the incorrect theological prayer. God, I want more of you. That is spiritually incorrect because God gave us everything. John 3, 16. It's God, what can I do to give more of me to you? Paul said in his greatest testimony in one verse, for I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So do you know what God's, way are? God's ways are? His guidelines for allowing areas of your life? Suppose God wants to use you to influence others in a godly way. Are you ready to acknowledge God's way in your life and be used by him? The children are back. Hallelujah. Amen. That's a blessing. Amen. Hallelujah. Spiritual noisemakers for Jesus. Amen. But finally this morning, the choice is ours. Remember that your sufficiency is in him, not in your own capabilities, but your sufficiency is in him. Trust him with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your paths, amen? amen? And when you trust God, when you look to him, when you allow him to be the leader of your life, good spiritual mechanics mean that I'm going to die to my flesh daily. It's a struggle out there. Amen? Amen. We're in an everyday fight. And we need to be guarded with the armor of God. Amen? We need to have on the breastplate of righteousness. We need to gird our loins with truth. We need to have the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation. We need to have our feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And we need to know that war that is out there, there are casualties that are people that are dying without Jesus Christ. And good spiritual mechanics means that we're going to align ourselves with the truth. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Father, this morning as we transition into honoring men today, Lord, thank you for all the men that you have given us. And Lord, today, as we honor them, we give you glory, we give you honor and praise. And Lord, as the head of the home and as the head of the church, God, Lord, allow us to lead where you've called us to lead as men, that you would be honored and glorified. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. What we're going to do now is, today the message was related on good spiritual mechanics. The gift that we have for you today is based out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. For consider your call, brethren, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. He chose what is weak to the world to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Good spiritual mechanics. Today, the gift that you're receiving from the church today, we hope that you'll be able to use in many ways around the home, to bless your wife with your good mechanical skills that some of you have. I don't have them. I'm not good with any of that stuff. I know, I know, I know where my place is. I'll see you after. 
My wife, Mary, and I would like to welcome you to Victory Lane. Thank you for choosing to worship with us today. It's our intention to provide a place of worship where people can build healthy spiritual lives for the Lord. We wish to do this by connecting people through a moving worship experience, building relationships with others, but most of all, making a connection with Jesus Christ and developing a personal relationship with Him.